Welcome, everyone, back to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited about our guest, JJ Virgin, in the house. Thank you so much for being Yay. here. I appreciate it. You have uh, a new book out called Miracle Mindset, A Mother, Her Son, and Life's Hardest Lessons. Make sure you guys go pick it up right now. You can get it ASAP. Uh, you are a New York Times bestselling author, four-time New York Times bestseller, correct, mm -hmm. of many different nutritional and health-related books, and you're a celebrity nutritionist, you're among many things, um, and you've been doing it for a long time, and you're looked at as one, long of, the, time. You're looked at as one <laughs> of the leaders in the space. You know, Every book you do is a huge hit, and you heal so many people through your message, but this is a different message. It's not necessarily a nutrition health-related message, although there's a different type of health related to it. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about um, why Miracle Mindset, why making this transition, and what is it exactly about? Well, you know what's so interesting is it seems like, you know, I've been going down this path and I went, er, but the reality mm -hmm. is we queried my community a couple months ago, mm -hmm. and we said, all right, if you're not where you want to be in your health, why is it? Now, I expected to hear, I can't give up my cheese, mm -hmm. right? right? Or right. I'm it's like, I'm sweets. a sugar addict, <laughs> right? Okay, because I mean, come on, like, I, you know, I'm all about getting rid of gluten and dairy uh. and lowering your sugar impact. So what I heard was blew my mind and not what I expected. Here's what it was. I don't feel good enough. I am not worthy. And I realized that, you know, heck, strategies abound, right? There's mm -hmm. no shortage of strategies on how to lose weight, how to get more energy. Yeah. But if your mindset's not dialed in, if you don't feel good enough, if you don't feel worthy, we're trying to hit a mindset issue with strategies and yeah. we'll fail every time. So in reality, it might look like I've taken this, you know, diversion, but really this has to sit up on top of everything you do in your life, whether you're trying to work on your business or your finances or your relationship or your mm -hmm. health. If you don't believe you're good enough, if your mindset's not there, you're going to be limited to wherever it is. Right. Wow. Okay. Have you always felt like your mindset's been worthy enough? I've never thought about my mindset prior to this really? whole thing. You know, so. But you were creating extraordinary results in your business, making multiple seven figures, New York Times bestseller, multiple, you know. Dr. Phil, all these different shows you've been on multiple times. Did you feel? That all sounds really great. Right. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a really great, wow, that's amazing. Who is that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> sure. And the other side of that is I was on Dr. Phil, and when I was on Dr. Phil, I got my own primetime pilot on really? ABC. Wow. You never saw it. Mm. Because I signed the contract, I taped it, and it went in the can. And it took me off TV, and I never saw it. You don't know about my first book because... It sold a thousand copies. The book before that actually never even came out. I had to give my business partner fifty percent to leave me alone because mm. he was going to own everything I ever did for the rest of my life. You know, you don't see the near bankruptcies. The reality is, it's not the Dr. Phil or the New York Times that gave me the mindset. We don't grow when things are fabulous. That's what we tend to look at. But the things that brought me to those places were all of the challenges that I've gone through every, you know, all through my life. Mm -hmm. That's what created it. And I never thought about the mindset piece until after what this book was written on, this whole accident where my son nearly died and people went, how the heck did you do it? Mm. You know, and at first I thought, well, it was because I was really healthy, you know, and, but the reality was that wasn't, didn't have anything to do with it. It had mm. to do with my mindset and, and how I decided to show up. Right, right. So what happened with your son, for those that don't know? Yes. Yeah, so about six weeks before the Virgin Diet's coming out. Now, I'll set this whole space. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the biggest book launch you're ever going to do. The and biggest book launch ever. I, I get this book advance. I take the entire book advance. I invest it into launching this mm -hmm. book. And then I go borrow some too. Right. I do a public television special. I have lined everything up because I know that this is my breakout, breakout thing. I've been using it, testing it, getting amazing results. This is it, right? So six weeks before, now six weeks before a book launch is mass insanity of all the things you still it's have crazy. to get done, it's right? Crazy. Okay, so it's craziness. And I've got two sons. They're 15 and 16. I'm a single mom. I am the financial support for my kids. My 16-year-old is bipolar, so things can be topsy-turvy. You never know what you're coming right. home to. And I come home, 
one afternoon and he is in a bad mood. Now he'd missed school that day. He'd gone to school and come home because he had a, a migraine, mm-hmm. right? That he'd miraculously recovered from. <laughs> and now he wants to go to martial arts. But right. the rule is like, if you couldn't stay in school, you don't get to go to martial arts. Yeah. So I'm saying no. And he's escalating the situation and I'm holding my ground. Mm-hmm. And I was actually super proud of how well I was handling this whole thing. Cause I was tired so I was like not reacting he gets madder and madder and madder and storms out of the house he looks back at me he goes mom I'm not as strong as you think I am he has nothing he's got a pair of shorts t-shirt no shoes nothing storms out it's dusk I look at that whole thing I think should I go get him and I think "Eh, let him go walk it off go to a friend's house I go into my garage to burst train right and the next thing I know my 15 year old son comes running into the garage and says, Mom, Grant's been hit by a car and airlifted to the local hospital. The weirdest thing, mm. it was like I wasn't even in my body anymore. It was like I was watching myself go get my stuff, you know, throw all my stuff into a tote bag. I ran out the door with my 15 year old son, Bryce, and my ex husband, and we drive to the hospital. And we're trying to get information as we're driving, but they won't tell us anything because he's a John Doe. We get there, and first of all, they're making us sit in the waiting room and not telling us anything. And everyone's looking very grim. So, you know, we're just sitting there freaking out. Then we get ushered into a conference room. And then the doctors start asking me questions. And finally, like, what was he doing? Why was he barefoot? Why was he out walking by himself? And I'm like, hold it. You know, like, we're not on trial here. What is going on with my son? And they say, Hmm. your son has been in a serious accident. Hit and run. Remind me to tell you what I found out later about the hit and run. Blow your mind. But hit and run accident. He's got a torn aorta. Now, a torn aorta kills 90% of the people on the scene. Wow. His was hanging on. He said, the doctor said it's like an onion skin. He had multiple brain bleeds, diffuse axonal injuries. He was in a deep coma. It's called a Glasgow 3, the deepest you could be in. He had 13 f- fractures. In fact, wow. when we were brought in to see him, he had bones sticking through. Oh he had gosh. road rash covering one half of his body. with. Gla- I was pulling glass out of him for months. Oh, my gosh. And the doctor said, we can't fix his torn aorta here because we'd have to use a blood thinner. What's, and he just would bleed so out. Just so I'm aware. What's an aorta? So <laughs> this is what's, <laughs> this is what's going to be pumping your 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 the blood into your heart. So gotcha. no it's aorta, torn. no Got no. It. No blood, no wow. heart. So think of either heart or brain, because that's basically the choice we were given. You can wow. either you can either have his heart or you can have his brain. But we if we don't fix his aorta, you know, he's not gonna have a heart and he's gone. And if we fix his aorta, his brain bleeds out, he's gone. Wow. So However <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No good solution. Uh oh. Yeah. But it turns out that there is a doctor that can do this without blood thinners. Now, you always have to ask the right questions. My ex-husband was a medical malpractice trial attorney. Mm. He goes, well, you know, what are the options? He goes, well, there is a doctor that could do this without blood thinners, but he'd never survive the airlift to that hospital. Even if he did, he'd never survive surgery. And even if he survived both those things, which is so slim, the chance he'd ever be normal, he's going to be so brain damaged. And my 15-year-old listening to this, so he, he goes... So like a 0.25% chance. <laughs> and So you're saying there's a chance. Yeah, yeah. And right? All we need. <laughs> and, and the doctor goes, that's right, son. He goes, here's my 15-year-old. We'll take those odds. Wow. And from that minute, I was like, we're in. What are you doing standing here? We're overruling you. Wow. And, and so, and that's why I say, there's the start of it. There's the mindset, the mindset that says, hey, I'm going to go with abundance, not scarcity. I hear 0.25%. I don't hear there's a 99.75% chance he's going, you know, he's dying here. We heard there's a 0.25% chance he's going to make it. We're grabbing that. Right. And so that was the first thing that we did was like, okay, we're overruling you. And, you know, I, I think back to that night because shortly after that, another kid came in with a brain injury to that hospital and died there. And I was trying to reach the parents going, get him out, you know, because so many people will hear that first opinion and go, Oh, okay. Instead of going, what are, what are all the possibilities? Mm-hmm. How can we be open to possibilities? So we airlift him. We have no idea if we're going to pick up a corpse, you know, or if right. we, I mean, that was a tough drive. And this, by the way, happened in the middle of the night. So 
at midnight we did the we're overruling you step. Now they had to get the doctor to agree. Right. There's like this Call one doctor, and, yeah, yeah. right? They fax the hospital. I'm like, we're really doing this. <laughs> they get a hold of this doctor. They get a hold of this doctor at 2 a.m. Now this is all getting set up. The doctor has to now assemble not only his team, because when a doctor, when when another hospital takes on a case, the first hospital gets to go, here, it's all yours, right? Mm -hmm. So this next hospital doesn't know if they're getting, you know, a a corpse or if there's anything they can do. They've agreed to this case because the the doctor had to get them to agree to the case. Now this vascular surgeon has to assemble his team, the orthopedic surgery team, the neurosurgery team, the critical care team, both for adults and peds. And he had to get the stint that he was going to use. But the stint he wanted to use was part of a study that had been discontinued two weeks ago. So no stints at his hospital. He had to get one flown in from another hospital. And then he was going to use it on my son who's 16 and it was only approved for adults. Wow. And he said to us later, he goes, yeah, I figured I'd ask for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <Yeah. laughs> I figured we could do life. that once he's alive. <laughs> I'm like, sure. <laughs> you know, so great. And I remember wow. when I walked into that hospital, literally walking in going, you know, you, you want to run in the door and then you don't want to go in at all because you just like, what is going on here? Mm-hmm. And that doctor walked up to me and he goes, is that your son? You know, and my he, there is full court press going on around my son. There's all these teams working on him, and I'm like, mm-hmm. He goes, I got this. Wow. Don't even worry. He goes, I do this all the time. I had someone thrown off the overpass last week. I fixed him. I'll fix him. Don't worry. You go to the waiting room. I'll come get you. That's nice. I'm like, all right. <laughs> I went up to the waiting room. It's now like 5.30 in the morning. I'm like, I've got to put my brain somewhere else. I'm writing blog posts. Yeah, <laughs> nice. And, uh... It's funny, we sat in there for two and a half hours, and my ex-husband was wearing a red shirt. He hadn't been wearing the red shirt earlier. He'd been wearing, he changed and put that on and drove to the hospital. My son later goes, you know when you and dad were in the waiting room, dad was in that red shirt? I'm like, wow. Wow. Yeah. He remembered. He saw us. He left, Mm. he left what he was doing, came over, checked us out, went back over there. Yeah, he's told us a bunch of stuff. I'm like huh Hmm. i've always been fascinated by the whole near death thing i didn't necessarily want to like experience it in this way but it is super interesting um so he came through that surgery the doctor came out to tell us everything had gone great he goes now i'm just the plumber i don't know if we'll ever wake up that's not my part right (laughs) you can talk to the neurosurgeons and so it was like kind of like we're high we're back low. And we go in to talk to the neurosurgeons. We're like, uh, you know, he's so brain damaged. And I'm like, you know, I'm not listening to this. I'm just, I'm not going to listen to this. Um, and I went in to see Grant and I stood there and I thought, you know, I, I kind of was standing there going, do I, what do I do? You know, freaking out. You're trying to control all of these negative thoughts because I don't want anything to enter my brain, anything negative yeah. because, you know, it, it felt like then that would become reality. I've just got to hold on to the positive. And it was funny, I was in there and I get this text from a client. And I don't know this person especially well. She didn't know I had kids. You know, I'd been coaching her on nutrition. And this text says, Grant is worried about you. He said he's going to be fine. You need to, you know, be stronger. I'm like, wow. okay, all right. It was just like, it was like, you know, that moon struck, snap out of it. I just went, all right, game on. I looked over and I said, Grant, you're going to be 110%. We've got this. Your name means warrior. We're going to do this. It's going to mm. be the best thing that ever happened. And I just kept repeating that to him. And when we were in the hospital and people would come over and say, we don't know if he's ever going to walk again. I'm like, no, no, no. get him out of the room. You know, right. I didn't let anyone around who was saying anything negative about him not waking up or not being able to walk. And later he said to me, because I literally, he was in the hospital for four and a half months. He was in a coma for weeks. Now I'm in my book launch. Yeah, yeah. a month yeah, away. That's now, still right, going right, on right. too. Yeah, yeah. Book launch is still going on. And I can't postpone that. You know, I remember, <laughs> you know, someone said, you don't worry about your job. Yeah, right. <laughs> you just go take care of your sweet boy. Mm. Your job will be waiting for you. I'm like, mm. no, it won't. I go, not only will my job not be waiting for me, I'll be bankrupt. And as much as, you know, publishers are human, it's a business, it's a business. and this is it. And if I'm not there, that book is going to go. And it affects the rest of your books in the future and your Oh, I'd be everything. done. Yeah. It was a, I looked at this and went, here's my son. He's lying in a coma. I'm going to do whatever it takes to bring him to 110%. That's not going to be cheap. 
Uh, <laughs> I need the money to make it happen. I got to make this happen. Yeah. And so this book launch just got 10 x Like mm. now there is, now I burned all the boats, yeah. you know, I am yeah. taking this island. And I realized <laughs> that there were two things I had to do. Be with my son, third leading cause of death, death by doctor, all the stuff that goes down in hospitals, third really? leading cause of death. First leading cause of death for children, brain injuries. Mm. So I'm like, I'm not leaving here, but I've got to make this book a huge success. So I'd literally sit next to my pictures of me in the hospital talking to him and working on my book launch, you know, just sharing what I'm doing, talking it out. And later he said, mom, the gray man came to the hospital and came down and asked me if I wanted to live or die. And I did not want to live. Mm. He goes, but I kept hearing your voice. Wow. So I told him I would. Wow. I know crazy stuff. Wow. Um, so yeah, so I got very essential. I love that book essentialism or uh-huh. then the one thing. And I, I'm really bad at doing that. You know, <laughs> yeah. all of us, too many ideas and all these mm-hmm. things you want to do, but you know that I, I credit the reason Virgin diet is a huge success is I didn't have any option. I, it wasn't, I was gonna, all in. I wasn't going to try to make it successful. It was like, Oh no, this is, this is a lifesaver now. This yeah. is it. Wow. So, wow. And how is your son now? So it has been a, you would think that the four and a half months of the hospital were the hard part. Yeah. No, no, no. The four years have been since then have been the hard part. And, um, it's made me realize that I have a way bigger purpose out there in terms of getting information out about brain health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously it is severe brain injury. Turns out 17 million people a year have a brain injury. Wow. 17 million. Well, think, have you ever hit your head? <laughs> I, I play football, so I hit my head right. many times. You know? uh, and so we think about, you know, football, soccer, volleyball yes. is actually one of the big yeah. sports that's problematic. You know, all of our veterans, anyone who's been in any car accident. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. in a car accident where I was hit head on and rear-ended in the freeway, and it cracked my Lexus SUV in half. So Whoa. this was a hard hit. And, you know, I passed out, came to, and went to the hospital, and they go, okay, well, you know, it's just going to take time. And I'm like, just time. Wow. When Grant was coming out of the coma, they said, it, uh, it's going to be ugly. Hmm. Now, I had no idea. I've only seen movies. And in movies, people come out of comas. They look at you lovingly. Right. I love you. So I, yeah. I thought, like, he'd wake up. He'd go, I love you, Mom. It's not what happens. <laughs> right. It is not what happens. Um, 25% of people who have brain injuries try to kill themselves or think about it. Mm. You know, it's, it's a major scary thing. The last four years, um, I've committed myself to making him 110% and figuring it out and then getting that information out to everybody. Mm-hmm. Because when someone has a brain injury, it's not just them who's affected. It affects family, every, friends, oh, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. So yeah. he's probably tried to kill himself now 10 times over the last four wow. years. And I have jumped him. We have, and I'm like going, I did not just go through all this. Like <laughs> you are not doing this, not on my watch, you know? Wow. Um, but it's, it's like they're a prisoner in their, their brain. It's a scary, yeah. scary it's thing. It's challenging. I think I mentioned to you last time we talked, my dad was in a car accident about 11 years ago and really traumatic head injury was in a coma for many months and never been the same you know it's it's yeah. even 11 years later i can have a conversation with him you know he he has some of the characteristics from the past but he's just he's not yeah the dad that i used to you know have he's a completely different person and he needs a lot of care and a lot of help and, and see, isn't able to function you know mm-hmm. with his words and the way he wants to he forgets a lot. He has a lot of amnesia, so he can't remember a lot of things. Yeah. He repeats himself over and over. It's just like, it's a challenge. Yeah. You know, there's been growth and, you know, I'm so grateful he's still around, but it's also like, it's really challenging, you know. Well, you can easy. heal the brain at any time. Mm-hmm. There's so much information that needs to be out there. And I was lucky in that the minute this happened, so I've got ideas for your dad. Mm-hmm. The minute this happened, I put an SOS out to my community. Yeah. I'm like, listen, I don't need your sympathy. I need your support. What you got? You know, Daniel Amon's in the hospital with me yeah, yeah. right away. You know, so I mean, I have amazing resources. Barry Sears was helping me with the whole fish oil thing. Dr. Michael Lewis. I got, you know, I got the guy who figured out the progesterone stuff. They're all, I'm, I'm talking to them. Them. So I was super fortunate with all of that. Um, he's been doing high dose fish oil. He did progesterone. Mm. Um, we've been doing interthecal stem cells 
wow. right into his growing his own stem cells, injecting them to his spine. It is waking him up. He mm. his memory he has memories back of when he was three and four years old now, like everything is shifting. Wow. Because I'm coming from a place of I believe that we can fix this and I'm going to make him 110% because yeah. there's things that make him better because of the accident, because now he's empathetic. He's mm-hmm. never been a victim, but, um, you know, these, these stories that we all have, everyone's yeah. had someone touch with a brain injury and yeah. yes, it can change him forever, but your brain can, you can continue healing at any point. So yes, we've done fish oil. We've done, obviously I was bringing also, I had a Nutribullet in his, in the hospital. As soon as he was starting to show that, you know, he could eat, he actually spit up his own feeding tube and I was like, okay, I'm all in now. <laughs> right. I was making him smoothies. Um, we couldn't get the hospital to do the fish oil like I want him to. So I just did it anyway right um and the progesterone cream but it's been the stem cells and then neurofeedback ping pong yep there's been a lot of things that we've done but um the neuro the stem cells have to me the biggest hope mm. and something you i'll, I'll yeah. share with you after sure, that sure, would sure. be for your dad because honestly um you look at what happens after a brain injury depression anxiety uh memory issues and then you think about the fact that at any one time 50 percent of us have something going on with depression anxiety mm. mood issues 26 and a half percent of people uh, in their lifetime are going to have some kind of mental illness and you go huh mm. you know what is there a correlation here i think there is yeah. i think we're misdiagnosing <clears throat> head injuries because we we don't think about it um i just had a, a friend post on facebook and i i am her. i'm like um you've got a problem here she goes my husband rolled off the top of the van as they got caught in the beach towel while he's putting the surfboards up and mm. he not got knocked out then he was talking kind of nonsense but we took him to the hospital and they said he's fine he doesn't have a head injury i'm like of course he has a head injury yeah. how could he not have a head injury wow. right it's crazy so, but these are the things that we need to treat yeah. we need to teach people that no it's not just about time right yep and you know yes there's tons of things you can do and you can do it forever because everything keeps healing. Mm-hmm. So That's your true. dad's still got, there's yeah. still a lot of stuff that you yeah. can do. And he's doing a lot better, your son, after four years. I mean, you've been through a so, lot. So, yeah. So I will tell you that some things he's 110%. There are parts of him that were better than before the accident. Hmm. He's more empathetic and nicer. He's never blamed this woman. There was, he got hit, um, this woman hit him, got out of the car, gasped, got back in the car and drove off. She was probably scared. and uh, Yeah. And, you know, people are like, did you find the woman? And it's one of the parts of the miracle mindset is forgiveness. Yes. And I go, I never focused on that. I had to focus on saving my son. And I go, and I don't know, like, okay, she shouldn't have driven off. Right. But I don't know. Maybe she had kids at home. She was like, I have Who no knows? idea what her situation was. It didn't matter. She saw another person pull in to protect him. And I don't know who who was at fault here and nor does it matter yeah it's like this is where we're at now she's got her own life to deal with yeah, he might have ran in front who knows what happened never we'll never know. know never know no one saw it because he's not you know he doesn't, he doesn't remember. remember yeah so who knows yeah. and so, even if you didn't know who she is it doesn't what it's gonna do for you, you know yeah. I, it was interesting because when i was in the hospital um my ex-husband called and said okay they found the woman and all of really? this stuff came up oh like this mama bear stuff i was like where is she you know and i was like <laughs> And then, <clears throat> and that's when, you know, you kind of realize I've got to work on this forgiveness part mm. because if you are, you've got to actively forgive people. It doesn't just happen of, okay, I'm not going to focus on that. I'll focus on saving my son. I had to go back and forgive her. I had to forgive my son for going and doing that. I had to forgive myself for not stopping him. You know, there's a lot of forgiveness mm-hmm. that had to go on just to be okay with all of that stuff. Wow. And it, you can't just put that in the closet. Is there anything you haven't forgiven yet? You know what? I've got a lot of stuff I need to forget. (laughs) I went, so our buddy Dave Asprey. Yes. Last two summers ago, he, you know, strong armed me as, you know, he can be so bossy. He said, JJ, you have to come to 40 years of Zen because he saw um, what happened from all of this is I got some pretty bad PTSD, right? As one Mm. could imagine. And um, I, nothing was giving me joy. I hit, I got the virgin diet. It became a New York Times bestseller. And then I, did three more books and I didn't even, I forgot I even did it. Someone said, what did you do? Cool. In the last six months I go nothing. Right. I totally, even. I mean, it was just, nothing was like, I just was mm. flatlining and he goes, you're coming to this thing. And I'm, it was, it was a week um, of neurofeedback. You stick things in your, your hair, 
like those guys were all lucky none of them i was with joe polish and mm. fish and i'm like no one else has to deal with all this right. you know <laughs> St- you had to stick electrodes in your head and you literally were down in these chambers and they didn't tell me what, what it was when i was going i just like all right i'll be there and it turns out you work through forgiveness because the fastest way to raise your alpha and to be more creative and to be happier is to forgive. Because mm-hmm. if you're angry, it will just sm- smush your joy. Absolutely. That's a scientific term. And so as I'm going through this first couple of days working on forgiveness, I'm thinking, I'm going to be here all year. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's been a lifetime. <laughs> this of is a peeling of onions because <clears throat> you go, okay, well, I need to forgive Grant. Well, then I got to forgive this woman. Well, I got to forgive myself. But then we've got to go back to everything that led up to that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I kept going back further and further and further. And Dave's one of my very best friends. And I'm going, you know, I think I need to forgive my birth mom. And he goes, you think? I think you might even need to go back further. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh. Okay. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, it's. I think that's an important point to bring up is forgiveness is a process that you're never done with you know mm-hmm. and uh because there's stuff that comes up all the time absolutely and i kind of check in i was really mad at someone for a couple of weeks and i just i was like you know how to go through this forgiveness stuff let this one go like and it's not a matter of just going oh it's fine you have to actively forgive someone mm-hmm. you have to go through and feel all the reasons you're so upset with them and then step over to their side and go all right let's look at it from their side let's be them for a minute which is huge Mm -hmm. hugely eye-opening and then find the gift in the whole thing because there's always a major gift you know you're not going to grow when like everything is perfect right that's true mom i'm curious about um what do you think is the misconception around people who have life altering event events or experiences you know you've went through one with your your son i've been through one with my with my dad for people who haven't been through one what do you think they uh um I guess their their misconception is around it. Their misconception. So biggest thing people have said to me since Grant got hit is, oh, I'm so sorry. And I look at it and I go, well, he didn't die. Right? right? You know? Um, and I think that our misconception on anything, whether it's that or just a really bad thing happening. So let's say that someone, you know, you were bankrupt or you went through a divorce. Yeah. Anything like that. What if we flip that to being, this is going to be the best thing that ever happened to me. I will be better because of this. I'll be a better person, a better father, a better husband, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's always something in there. And in in the moment, I mean, heck, in the moment with Grant, I was scared to death. When we were making that decision that we were going to overrule those doctors, I stood outside at the hospital and um, I just got totally present, which is never been very easy for me to do. I just stood out there. It was, you know, now like 11 o'clock at night. And I just stood out there and listened. And I went, Grant, what do you want me to do? Because here was my big fear. Overrule the doctors, go charge in there, be, you know, bossy, tell them what they're going to (laughs) do. Have no problem doing that. (laughs) And he is a vegetable. Or he is so damaged. And, and I went, I want to do what's going to be best for him. You know, that's the whole, what do I do? And I just stood out there and got quiet. And it was, it was funny. I was describing it to um, this guy, Roz, who founded Hoffman Institute. Mm -hmm. And he goes, you know, you had a divine experience there. That was like, it was, you know, because I just stood out there and it was like, just like lightning bolt of boom, save your son. And I'm like, I marched and I'm like, that's it. You know, this is what we're doing. It was like, I knew exactly what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. But there are still times along the way I would sit there when he came out of a coma he was staring off into space he was staring sideways i have pictures you can see that no one's home moving his arm back and forth for days and i'm thinking "Uh uh-oh is Mm. this what i what did i do here you know so i had to so manage all of that fear and that's why Mm. i just held on to the hope you know and and so if you say okay my plan is he's 110 percent, and here's what i'm going to do to do that and every day you look for any little win that tells you that you're going in the right direction and sometimes it was a very small win yeah you know (laughs) he uh wrinkled his nose i mean there was not for months and months and months years any sign he was going to be 110 percent at all Mm-hmm. But I just figured, you know what? I'm going to go with 110% because if I make it to 80, I win. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And uh, and we're already past 80. I, I we we kind of go between 90 and 110 oh, right now. That's great. Um, 
And there's some really bad times, but they're few and far between compared to the really good times. You know, there's bad times with people who are healthy. I know. You know what I mean? It's like there's horrible times with people who have the brain <laughs> and everything figured out. You know what I mean? So it's all good. You know, we're never going to be perfect. I'm curious, though. You you know, you've been teaching nutrition and physical health for many years. And now you have this experience of kind of like this spiritual, mental health experience. What did you learn about um, from this process and and is the spiritual side of well-being just as important as the nutritional and physical side now for you, or has it always been that way? Um, I haven't ever paid attention to it before. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talked about mindset, it just was who I was, and I never really looked at how you developed that. And I think the reason that I'm very left brain, yeah. so I think the reason <laughs> I always focused on nutrition and, and exercise was they were so measurable yes. it was so obvious I could draw out an Results. algorithm I knew exactly your labs are this it. you need yeah. to do that you know and all of a sudden uh, people are going well how'd you do that and I'm like uh and and then as I was going through this I went could I teach this like is there a way to help someone develop this mindset when, mm. once we know that you're not in a fixed mindset you're not a victim that life doesn't happen to you that you can be responsible for your life, control it, build it, create it because of your mindset. Then the next question is, can you make that? Can you build that? Mm. Is it like a muscle? So that's, I decided, okay, let's, let's say that mindset's a muscle. You can develop it. So what is it exactly? Cause I have to measure everything, mm. right? Yeah. So can I actually you create, it? yeah. Can you measure it? And so then I broke it up to what were my attributes that I saw in me. And then I started going around, like when we interviewed you and mm -hmm. we interviewed just a group of people, I look and I go, okay, you're doing amazing things. And here was the common denominator. Every single person I know in my life who's doing amazing things has gone through some crap. Yes. Every single one of them, all of them. And as I went through, I went, what are the common attributes? Things like abundance minded, right? Courageous, resilient. So I just built all of those up. And then I created a way to, to evaluate them. Because mm -hmm. that's my little left brain can totally yes. deal with that. And then I took a group of people through it. I want to see, could I train this? And here's what's crazy. Because it's like, all right, you know, because I never saw myself. I, I, I'm sitting here doing this and, and selling this PD book. And I'm like, but I'm not a personal development person. I'm mm -hmm. a nutritionist. And, <laughs> but, but in reality, aren't we all personal development teachers all of us mm -hmm. at any level right a mom is a personal development teacher yeah so absolutely. you know so I'm taking this group through this and this has never happened by the way when I've taken people through a diet program you see people have amazing results and it does impact all the other areas of their life but this is the first week of a coaching call and we're going through this first exercise to build resilience and this gal gets on and she goes I want to do that but I can't and I go okay, why not? What's in your way? Right? And she goes, I don't feel good enough. I don't feel worthy. And I go, well, if you were worthy, if you did feel that way, what would you say about yourself? And she goes, well, people wouldn't believe it, but I am smart. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I go, okay, that sounds good. What else? You know, and she starts listing out all these things things about herself and I'm putting it on our Facebook group page you know angel is smart angel is kind and then I put an angel is worthy and all of a sudden all these people on this call are on this page and they're putting it angels worthy angels were, and I'm mm. watching this my team and I've got some big guys you know <laughs> are crying they're yeah, crying yeah. in the office right and I'm going oh, wow because uh, I had been leaning away from this. And I tell people, if something's scary, that's where you need to go. Mm -hmm. Like, if it's not scary, you're not playing big enough. And this has scared me to put doing this, scared me, terrified me. Nutritional, you can do all day. Yeah, yeah. It, it's easy. And that's why, honestly, why am I doing this? Because it terrifies me. Mm -hmm. And I know I have to. And I see the difference in people when they do this. You you go through and up-level your mindset. You can go take on your health. Right. You know, you can, you can go change your business. You can mm -hmm. get a better relationship. All those things are going to uplift, but you don't fix your mindset and you have a, a fixed mindset that believes that you can't do it, that life happens to you, that you're the victim. No amount of our great strategies are going to do a thing. Right. 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 So what's it come down to worthiness first? Is that kind of the foundation of what you teach is how to build that or building the confidence or. So I actually, what I do first is measure again, cause I'm, I'm always evaluating. Mm -hmm. Um, and then 
I just start them. I have seven lessons that go along with the lessons in the book. And again, yes. it was like when people started to go, how did you do this? My first response when people were like, how were you able to do that? I go, well, I was really healthy when I went into the hospital. Yes. First thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was. I mean, right. I went in. Physically and healthy, yes. I was super physically healthy. I was under ridiculous stress. So I decided that my self-care came above everything else. Mm-hmm. And, and I yes. know people, they're looking going, well, that's so selfish. I go, it actually was the most selfless thing I could do because you don't go into the ICU if you're sick. Right. And so I went, you know, if I'm going to be making life and death decisions and I'm going to pull this out, I cannot even have a sniffle. This is, I'm going to take, uh, so I was getting my eight to nine hours of sleep. I was burst training in the hospital stairs. I had friends sending in food. I was on it, right? Wow. I totally nailed that stuff. And at first when people said, how did you do it? I go, oh, I was super healthy. And then when I realized no, that was not the case at all it was the decision above that mm. and then I went well what how would I take someone through this and so it's really taking them through a series of lessons and looking at each of those things how do we move from a scarcity mindset to abundance mindset yeah. you know how do we how do we um, I actually have a really crazy exercise that okay. I take people through that someone took me through I had a mentor in my 20s that had me do this silly exercise mm-hmm. and uh, so she has you take out a sheet of paper and write down everything you want. Okay, and fill it up. Like physical so, things or achievements or physical things. So I want, or, I want, you know, this car. She says, I don't care, you know, a just house, be a car, materialistic. Boat, whatever, yeah. uh, you know, what kind of vacations, jewelry, shoes, everything, write it all down, fill up the paper. And I still remember sitting in this room. I remember where I was writing it down. And I remember the things I wrote on there. I wanted a teal green jaguar. Mm-hmm. And I wanted a condo in Maui. And I thought I was like thinking huge, big. big, big, big. Okay. So then she says, all right, so tell me what's on your list. Right. And we're, there's a bunch of us in here, but she, I was, she was uh. my mentor. So I'm like listening out. She goes, oh, that's, that's great. That's great. <laughs> I, so I just have a, a question for you on the, on the Jaguar. So um, why just one? And I said, well, I don't need more than one. She goes, I didn't ask you what you needed. She goes, so that condo in Maui, like, why just a condo? And I go, okay, I'll take a house. She goes, well, why did you want a condo? She goes, well, I, you know, I don't need that much. She goes, no, this isn't about what you need. Just why not the house? And I go, okay, house. She goes, well, why not, like, Maui? Mm-hmm. Just take, you know, and it was like crazy when you start to realize that we limit ourselves every, so we always do it, mm-hmm. right? So just that way of starting to go, huh, am Even with I? with physical possessions, yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's just that's just a sign of exactly, it. I mean, if you yeah. do it in one, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything, mm-hmm. right? But I'll tell you that, to me, and I always look at this, it, this is going to be my, my vegetable analogy, because in health, I think, gosh, so many things would just get better if people would just get a good night's sleep and eat more vegetables. Right. A lot of stuff gets better. You know, we're so worried about, am I getting enough of this micronutrient? I'm like, eat your vegetables, right? right? Gratitude is to vegetables, you know, right? It's like gratitude. We think of vegetables for health and gratitude for personal development. You want to get more resilient. You know, you want to change your life. The best thing that you can do Mm. is start every single day in gratitude. And when I looked back and went, what helped me get through all of this stuff in the hospital? The biggest thing was making sure I had my morning routine dialed. And every day it was get up and what are my things I'm grateful for? Three things, write them down and find something right right find something people are like i don't have anything i'm like you're awake you're alive you know yeah your eyes are open you can do it yeah so so those are some of the things i've yes. built the lessons but that was the big question mark is could this be teached without you having to go through all this stuff right right but here's the other thing is you never know when this stuff's going to happen never know and are you ready and how do you get ready? Well, you have to lean into fear. You have to, to do things that scare you. You have yeah. to get out of your comfort zone. So, and you know, you have to actively pursue that. Otherwise you won't, mm-hmm. which is why I think it's great to have coaches and support communities that yes. all cheer you on from going and doing the hard things. Mm-hmm. Cause in life we tend to shy away from doing the hard things. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And in the book you have all the examples of how to build this mindset and all these different lessons. Correct. Right. Okay, cool. Um, I want to ask a few more questions before I, f- I finish with the final few. Is there a question you wish people would ask you Uh-oh, that they the don't? the final few. Yes. Before I ask the final <laughs> few questions, is there a question? You didn't warn me about the final few. <laughs> before I ask them, is there a, f- is there a question that uh, you wish people would ask that they don't? 
Hmm. Yeah, you know, what I'd love to be asked, because I think that there's a perception uh, when you look at someone and, you know, you sat down, you said, okay, you've been on Dr. Phil and, and mm-hmm. you've got these books and it looks like it's been easy. And, you know, that you just kind of roll through and go jump on a TV set or write a book. And, and I, what I want people to see is the struggle. Because I think when we just see that and then we're not there, we all judge ourselves and go, well, I could never do that. Look at, they just like plopped those books out. They just right. got on that TV show. And, you know, we're all scared and we all struggle. And so I think that's the big thing that I'd, I'd like to pull up more in interviews is what, mm. you know, what's scary and, you know, what's the struggle? Okay. Well, what's scary and what's the struggle <laughs> right now? <laughs> um <laughs> You know, I've really looked at a lot of what's been super important. And I was just talking to my fiance about that. And I go, you know, there's not a lot of things that scare me. Um, You know, you can take all my money away and I'll go work and do it again. And I don't need to have a whole bunch of fancy stuff. And, you know, don't take my shoes away. But but, um, what what would scare me is losing the people around me who I love. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the big one. That's the big yeah. one. And so what's the struggle really is um, I am an adopted kid and you there's a thing with adopted kids. And I've, I've never really wanted to talk about it because I always thought mm. it makes me sound like a whiner, like I'm ungrateful because, you know, when you're an adopted kid back when I was adopted, my parents had to really fight for it to get to be able to adopt a child. They ma- actually matched you. But mm. my birth mom gave me up for adoption she was engaged my birth father and he wanted her to drink quinine and abort wow thankfully she said no wow. and she went to a, a home for unwed mothers in san francisco and gave me up and then they put me into a foster home for six weeks they made you have a holding period i'm like going well that's the worst plan ever like six weeks of limbo for a baby during that most important bonding thing wow and then put me into um this place with my adopted parents who have done the best they can, but I'm so not, there's just not that, there's never been that bond, Mm. you know, it's like that bond. So you grow up feeling unloved and unworthy, right? You know, and it's like, so that's the biggest thing. When I came down to like, when you start to look at what you want in your life and then you go, well, why do I want that? Why do I want that? Why do I want it? And you can dial it all back. I was like, ultimately why I want all these things is you just want to be loved. Yeah. And so actually you don't have to do a whole bunch of that stuff because it's not so important anymore. Mm -hmm. You can just go. Be loved. Be loved. (laughs) Love and be loved. (laughs) It's so much easier. Wow. (laughs) Love people and let them love you. (laughs) I didn't know this about you. Do you know your parents yet? Have you you met them or no? So yeah, I met my birth parents. Um, I got rejected again. So not once but twice. So um, Mm. yeah, my ex-husband reminded me of that. I have a super great relationship with my ex-husband, but I, I went and sought out my birth mother because how could you not want to know? Of course. And again, my, my adopted parents, have, you know, were great parents, mm-hmm. tried hard. Um, and they were open about it from early They were ages open and... about it. They always told me about it. You know, and it's funny because the big, the big fat lie to adopt kids is that you're so special because more people wanted you. I'm like, no, not really. Your Uh, mom, like, I'm a mom. You, as clearly as you've seen, you would have to kill me to take my kids away. (laughs) Like, I will do whatever for them. Sure. And, I mean, that's just in our DNA. So, you know, when you've got someone, and I know, I know, because I went through the forgiveness protocol, because Dave's like, yes, I think we need to go there, you know, of what it was like for her to be a scared, unwed mother who was engaged to this guy who now wants her to abort, and she doesn't want to give me up to his crazy mom and so hey she did the best she could do and now I've really fully like all of a sudden I was like okay I forgave her I forgave him you know my mom everybody Hmm. um but I met my birth mom and and I met my birth dad and he made me take a paternity test and uh 99.999 I'm like wow okay we'll do this um how old were you? I was 25. Wow. So my birth dad had never told his wife. He was still in love with my mother. That made oh it kind of weird. Because when I met him, he's like, oh my gosh, you're just like her. And, and I'm like, okay, stop it. But um, he married a debutante, like Miss Oregon. Mm. Just the kind of person who's not my type of person, you mm. know. 
Um, and they lived in a little, they're very provincial. They'd never really left Oregon. They yeah. literally white picket fence. Right, right. So, and I like show up. <laughs> it's like, uh oh. <laughs> right. He goes, I never told her about you. I'm like, oh. well, you know. Um, so that was. That was wow. the problem. Wow. Um, yeah, so I met everybody, but there was no, it's not like they're your family. They're not right. your family. You know, when people talk to your real parents, your real parents are the people who had to deal with you growing up, right? Those are the your real parents. The whining and crying. The whining and, yeah. and crying, you know, those are your parents. Sure. These people were my uh, biological parents, but they're not my parents. Mm-hmm. So, wow. so it kind of puts you as like, there's really no place for them, but, mm-hmm. you know, it just. What's the biggest lesson you learned about your biological mom? What's the biggest lesson she's taught you throughout your life, whether she's told you something or not, but something you've learned that's been powerful for um, you? You know, she taught me by not doing, and it's it's interesting because I believe that, you know, sometimes negative role models can be the most powerful of all. Mm-hmm. I understand now that she gave me up because that was what she believed to be the best thing. I still think it, whenever possible that – birth kids should be with their birth families because there's mm-hmm. this genetic I mean when I met her I got off the plane and looked at a woman dressed just like me wow. same taste same I am I grew up in a very like Ward and June Cleaver family with parents who golf and dad mm-hmm. who has a job waiting for a ship to come in you know just very uh, very unlike me my dad is a massive entrepreneur my mom is a scientist and her whole family are athletes his family are models it was like you finally met your tribe right (laughs) and so um but it was funny when I met her again she was very judgy and Hmm. you know the one thing that 25 when you were 25 yeah she was just kind of judging who I was and how I was and it was interesting to see because I'm a parent and I may not love all the choices my kids make although it's rare that I have issues with them but I mean they might do things I disagree with but I love them unconditionally Mm -hmm. that will never change and so it was interesting to see that because I was like going you know what I think that the most powerful gift you can give your kids is the gift of of unconditional love that's that was the big lesson that I learned with this Mm. wow amazing Um, okay well thank you for sharing and letting me know that that's what you want people to ask you about there you Um, go well, now they don't have to because they heard the answer. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, is there anything else you wish people would ask you? Hmm. Um, no, I'm now totally nervous about this speed round thing. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, a few final <laughs> questions. You'll be great. Um, this is called The Three Truths. And it's many, many years from now. You've written however many New York Times bestsellers. You've achieved everything you want to. Uh, and um, anything on the list of dreams that you write down now, you make happen. You have this abundant lifestyle. Anything you want, you create it. And it's the last day for you, many, many years. And for whatever reason, all your books have been erased, all your videos, all the work you put out there is gone. And it's the last day, and your whole family's there, and some great, great grandchild walks up to you and gives you a piece of paper and a pen and says, we don't have anything physical to remember ourselves or be remembered by you. Um, can you write down three things you know to be true of all the lessons you've learned, of all the experiences you've had, of all the people you've met? What are the three things, the three truths that you would leave behind? And this is all we would have to remember from your three lessons. Hmm. Lesson one has to do with integrity so I've always lived as if anything I do you could publish in the paper that I'm being true to myself my message so live with integrity number two you know put your family and your loved ones above everything else they are your Mm. your biggest gift Um, and number three forgive as quickly as possible Mm. that was great Thank you. Um, I want to take a moment, JJ, to acknowledge you for forgiving all the people in your life and for developing this incredible mindset because the things that you've learned and the things you've been through have been challenging, but they're creating so many blessings in the world for so many people. So I want to acknowledge you for the gifts you have and 
your creativity, your hard work, your uh, overcoming all these challenges, and also for showing up differently now than you ever have because of this struggle that you went through. So I want to acknowledge you for all your incredible gifts, and I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there is uh, one final question I want to ask you. Before I do, make sure you guys pick up the book. It's called Miracle Mindset. Go grab it right now. More lessons on how to have this abundant mindset and to really overcome challenges in your life. So make sure you guys pick it up. Final question I want to ask you is, what is your definition of greatness? It's pretty simple. Leave it better than you found it. That's the big thing I strive to do when I when I leave this planet is I want to make sure I've left it better than I found it. Yeah. There you go. JJ, thanks for coming on. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.